Let's go ahead and get started, yeah? Okay, uh, thank you for those of you guys for joining us virtually. We're really happy to have you all here with us. Um, I'm Rebecca Dynam. I'm um, the chair of the Health Professional Network, so welcome. We're going to be talking about social determinants of health tonight, and I think it's a very timely topic with everything going on in our society and our world nowadays. So um, we have a wonderful, wonderful panel of speakers for all of you joining us, and you're going to hear from them shortly. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Jewish Federation. So the Jewish Federation is the central organization of Jewish Los Angeles. We put Jewish values in action to meet our community's needs and make our voices heard on issues from ranging from anti-Semitism to social services to ensuring a strong Jewish future. The Federation cares for the most vulnerable, inspires Jewish journeys, connects with and supports the people of Israel and Jews around the world. In addition, Jewish Federation actively engages on Los Angeles civic life to build bridges with other communities. This important work is accomplished by working with dedicated partners, generous donors, and our leadership. So on behalf of the Federation, thank you for joining us here tonight. So now I would like to turn it to Dr. Sarika Klein, who's the field medical director at Neuropsychiatry at Biogen. She's gonna be moderating the discussion tonight and she'll get us started with our panelists. Thanks, Rebecca. I am so excited to be here tonight and um, really looking forward to this panel discussion. Uh, we have, um, tonight we're going to be talking about a very important topic, and we have some great panelists here who I'm grateful for giving up their time and their um, dedication to this topic as well. So just to talk about what is social determinants of health, and then we'll go into introducing our panelists as well. Um, social determinants of health is defined by the CDC. It's the non-medical factors that influence health outcomes. So they're the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age, and wider set forces and systems shaping the conditions of daily life. So these uh, forces and systems include economic policies and, and systems, development agendas, and social norms, social policies, racism, climate change, and political systems. And social determinants of health is a huge hot topic right now. It's one of the three priorities um, pr priority areas for healthy people in 2030 for the CDC. So again, really hot topic for tonight. So we have three amazing panelists here that are going to be discussing what social determinants of health mean to them. Uh, but before I introduce my panel, our, our panel tonight, I want to let you know that there will be time for Q&A afterwards. Please feel free to use the Q&A feature or the chat um, to ask your questions at that time. So please welcome our panel, Dr. Arash Asher, Dr. Nilufar Tehrani, and Dr. Anastasia Plugina. So Dr. Arash Asher, I'd love if you could introduce yourself, please. Well, thank you so much for the invitation and opportunity to be with you. I am a, a rehabilitation physician by training, and I went on to do more training in cancer rehabilitation. And I've basically spent um, my entire career, uh, the last 15 years, focusing on the health of cancer patients and cancer survivors. So I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Wow, that's amazing. That's great work. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Nilafar Tavrani. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Dr. Nilafar Tahrani. I'm a general pediatrician um, by training. Um, most of my career has been spent in uh, taking care of kids and families and underserved communities, many of whom experience a lot of the issues we're going to talk about tonight. Um, the particular passion of mine is community advocacy and education and teaching um, as part of my job and working towards um, expanding the role into the community. That's great. We look forward to hearing about it. Um, and Anastasia, how about you? Yes. Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Anastasia Plugina. Um, I work at the Jewish Federation uh, um, in the Caring for Jews in Need Department. Um, I've been here for, um, I would say, about five months. But prior to that, um, I was working at Jewish Family Service of Los Angeles for 11 years. Um, I started as a social worker working with Holocaust survivors. I worked with people lacking basic needs and in crisis who came to a food pantry. Um, and I saw them there. Um, and uh, once I got licensed, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. I became a supervisor over, and later a director overseeing um, two large state funded programs for older adults and people with disabilities um, that help them um, remain independent, 
um, in their own homes and stay safe and avoid um, being placed in nursing homes. Very excited to be here today. Thank you. We're very excited to have you here. Um, so this question is for all of the panelists, but we'll first start with Dr. Tehrani. Um, Dr. Tehrani, tell me, what does social determinants of health mean to you? And why is it important in the healthcare community? Um, so there's a couple ways um, that I think about social determinants of health. Me personally, I think um, any of us who have experienced any type of adversity or any of the topics and the CDC definition is a, is a great one that kind of encompasses all of the factors that social determinants of health are can attest to that. And on top of that, if you have yourself or members of your family or friends have experienced health issues that have either not been addressed or if there have been challenges addressing because of any of these factors. Um, so on a personal note, that is something that that means to me. In terms of the career side of things, I'm gonna use an anecdote. When I started medical school training, I remember there was room full of students and all of us bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. And the first thing that came out of the lecturer's mouth was 50% of the things we're going to teach you in the next four years may be incorrect. We just can't tell you which 50%. And I think specifically thinking about social determinants of health and how over the last 10 years, my own career has kind of taken a shift in thinking about medicine in these contexts. I think I'd have to change that statement and say, we actually will not be teaching you 50% of the things that you might need to know. And social determinants mm -hmm. of health is absolutely this unteachable, although there has been more, I think, in medical school curriculum, but it's really this awareness that these factors um, can affect health for a variety of reasons. And so it's incredibly important in the healthcare community to be aware of it and to have some tools and resources to address it. Thank you. That's, that's really important, obviously, because I feel what it means to me, I'll be honest with you, I didn't really talk about what I do, but I'm a pharmacist and I work at a pharmaceutical company doing drug discovery and research and education. Um, and really there's a lot of people who just can't access healthcare um, and also have difficulty uh, being represented in clinical trials across healthcare um, as well. So I think it's really important that that is fixed. <laughs> so we need to make sure we educate across the um, community for that as well. So Dr. Arash Asher, I would love to hear from you as well. So if I may, because um, because my whole focus has been on cancer survivorship, uh, maybe I could use one of our studies on at least to illustrate how, how I great. to be involved in this space. Um, so I, I know this is primarily a health care crowd, but just we're on the same page. Fatigue is even though it seems like a mundane issue, it is probably one of the most distressing issues for cancer survivors. This idea that you can't get your activities of daily living done, you're exhausted, you feel unrefreshed. It's a quite, it's a rather distressing feeling for many of our survivors. And, and the assumption was always that it was the amount of chemotherapy, the extent of your surgery, the, you know, the, the number of radiation sessions that mm. you predicted your fatigue levels. And I had this wonderful opportunity to participate in a clinical trial. It was the largest of its kind, I think still to this day, to actually follow people 18 months from before their diagnosis, checking their blood, you know, doing psychological surveys, a battery of assessments were done. And then after their treatment was, uh, was done, whether it was surgery, chemo or radiation, six months later, 12 months later, 18 months later in time, to try to predict like who really are those people that struggle with fatigue 18 months after all the treatment is in. And again, the assumption was it was going to be the chemo, the surgery. Mm -hmm. And um, of course we were wrong. And there were really primarily two predictors of, again, the most distressing symptom in cancer survivorship, which was a history of depression. Again, prior to their breast cancer diagnosis, and along those lines, um, childhood maltreatment. So hmm. whether they had sexual abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, real or perceived. What went on in their experience years, right, decades before their breast cancer diagnosis was most predictive of who was going to struggle, right? Who, who was going to have this 
inner biology that was going to somehow synergize with their chemo radiation and surgery to presumably produce more of these inflammatory cytokines that would perpetuate these symptoms. So it, it, for me, it just really opened up that, you know, this idea that of, um, I think what's termed sociogenomics, right? This idea of how, how we live our life, our thoughts, our beliefs, our experiences, how I make, make an imprint in our epigenetic mm-hmm. you know, expression that may make a, a really meaningful influence in our, in our biology and our health. So that's how I've come to think about these things is not just ask about how are you doing now, but a little bit more about your previous history, your previous mm. social history and whatnot. That's really interesting. Um, I went to a lecture recently because I'm in the depression space right now as we, so it's very interesting you brought that study up um, where the sociogenomics that you talked about is really relevant and that it actually can be passed down genetically by your, so they joke, you know, they say you, what your grandmother did can actually affect the grandchild. It's, it's really amazing what, what happened to your grandmother can really affect what happens in the DNA of the grandchild. So uh, it's, it's really fascinating that you brought that up. Um, all right, Anastasia, your turn. What do you think about social determinants of health and how, can it, um, how is it important to the community? Um, I'm going to talk about it more from a social service um, point of view. As a licensed marriage and family therapist working at the Federation, overseeing our partnerships and social service agencies, um, and as a previous social worker, um, social determinants of health uh, mean, I guess, everything to me in this work. Um, when social workers provide direct services to clients on the ground, uh, doing the right assessment of social determinants of health is incredibly important, and it's a first step in really helping clients achieve their goals. Um, it's very important to ask the right questions about um, their employment, their education, if they have safe housing, if they have a support system, um, if they're able to access food and transportation, um, do they have income, do they have public benefits, health insurance. All of these mm-hmm. questions are crucial uh, to identifying the interventions um, that the social workers will um, work on in case management and to making the right referrals um, for these clients. Um, I've learned that simply asking clients if they have a working phone is um, often a critical step in understanding um, if they're going to be able to follow up with their health professional. Um, Access to safe transportation is another um, important step in ensuring clients will show up for their doctor appointments. Um, I've learned that sometimes giving clients bus tokens, giving them bus passes or um, taxi books will go a long way um, in ensuring that they will um, follow up with the doctor's appointment. And um, a lot of um, people that I saw myself at the the food pantries or in other settings couldn't speak English. Um, Or if they could speak English, they didn't know how to advocate for themselves. Mm. Um, So it was very important um, to get on the phone with them um, and to model for them how to speak to um, service providers successfully, um, how to lead a conversation, how to advocate for their needs um, with their um, healthcare professionals and other service providers. And uh, working with older adults um, in many cases was even more challenging because this population is more vulnerable. I would say it's one of the most vulnerable populations in our community and they have the least amount of resources available to them. Um, One of the most important steps working with that population uh, was assessing their social determinants of health, in particular, if they had a support system. So if they were lucky enough to have a support system, um, social workers would work very closely with their relatives, their friends, their their children, whoever they had in their support network um, to ensure that these clients are safe and their needs are met. Um, Another important aspect in working with older adults uh, was care coordination among um, service providers, including health plans, and really working with those health plans professionals 
to ensure clients have transportation to go to their appointments. They do have translation available to them. Um, if they um, are unable to ambulate themselves, that they have somebody to go with them, um, that they understand their benefits uh, through their health plans. Um, and um, eventually in, in their homes, they have medical equipment um, and home care needed to successfully remain independent um, in their homes. That's, that's great. I mean, you really answered my second question, which was how do you um, make change in the social determinants of health? So I appreciate that answer and, and what it means to you. So thank you for that. Um, Dr. Asher, I'll go to you and ask, in your clinical practice, how do you try to strive and make change in the social determinants of health for your patients? Well, um, you may be familiar with Dr. Gabor Mate, if I'm pronouncing his name right, but he, um, I think, is considered one of the leading experts on the impact of trauma on your health. And I remember he, he once said, and this always stayed with me, that um, trauma is not something he would say that happens to you, but it's the meaning that we make from these experiences mm. that really yeah. determines our health. And, and I personally, I don't, this may be on the controversial, I don't love the term social determinants of health, at least when used in the patient context, because it really almost sounds nihilistic, right? There's nothing, almost as if there's nothing you can do about what happened mm. to us in our upbringings in, in a way. And we know, and Anastasia, you know, alluded um, to many of these ideas, there are um, numerous interventions that can make a meaningful impact. So for example, there have been actually randomized clinical trials where you have a group of adults um, doing an act of kindness or service for mm. a neighbor or a friend, actually showing epigenetic changes with markers of distress and, and mm. what's known as the CTRA gene, which is gene expression related to adversity in six weeks, right? So in, in, in just a short amount of time, um, you can change gene expression. Mindfulness interventions have shown yeah. similar benefits. Mindfulness, in, uh, um, gratitude journals, exercise interventions, spending time in nature. So I think it's important to be aware of, you know, social, I'll call it shapers of our health um, without necessarily being nihilistic that we are doomed and our epigenetic genome right. cannot be altered in some way. Is it something that you look at um, and ask your patients proactively about or know? I mean, how do you know if there's an issue that they're facing with regard to social influencers, so to speak? Or Great she question. And, you know, we have trainees coming through um, our clinics all the time. And one of the things I impose upon them um, with their first you know, uh, week with us is to ask about how they were doing, in our case, before their cancer diagnosis or rather that. Um, because, right, I mean, the fatigue study that I alluded to earlier, yeah. the point of identifying those patients earlier on who were going to, or more likely to have fatigue 18 months later was not just to be again, nihilistic about it, but to intervene, right? So that we could recognize, okay, this person had childhood adversity, high levels of depression, anxiety right. prior to the diagnosis. Let's be on higher alert so we can intervene with all these various programs that we know can probably make a meaningful difference. That's great. Grateful for physicians and practitioners like you who are you know, aware of this issue and uh, especially imparting that knowledge upon the trainees. So thank you for that. That's great. Um, and Dr. Tahrani, uh, same question for you. Uh, how do you try in your practice to improve social determinants? Or maybe we should change it, social influencers of health. Yeah, I really love um, all the comments, especially I think the term is, is inadequate and fully yeah. encompassing that. Um, I, I just want to second, especially kind of from a pediatric perspective. So our job, my job, especially in primary care is to prevent things from happening. And there is 90% of the almost, you know, 80 to 90% of factors that you can't really touch in a 20 minute visit. And so that mm. child's de development from the minute they're conceived, which we've talked about the epigenetic changes, the pregnancy of the mother, what stressors she encountered. Um, she had enough food to eat. If that fetus felt food insecurity, the genes could change to actually 
promote obesity in the future. These are well studied mm -hmm. um, effect. And that's just one small factor all the way to mental health, substance abuse, you know, the effects of that on a more extreme level. And then that child growing in an environment um, that's facing that and then becoming an adult. Um, so it's kind of the spectrum. Um, and I think the, there have been studies, so adverse childhood experiences, there were large cohorts over the years, and it basically proved that if you have one or more of these types of experiences that predisposes you to cardiovascular disease. Um, you know, we know about stress and cancer even um, as part of that, and it can be mitigated by those protective factors. So I, I think based off of those studies, one thing that we've established, at least in our, where I work, and it's becoming because of just the large population that experiences these is doing ACEs screening. So giving families and parents a form and asking them these targeted questions, um, not just to assess needs, but really to raise an awareness of, are you facing these stressors now mm. or have you had this in, your, in the past? And so there's a dual form where, especially for older children, we give parents and those teenagers separate mm. forms so that we get both perspectives. So I think um, part of why that was possible is policy change in the state of California. There was actually, I believe it was 2019, that policy provided funding for Medicaid populations for us to do this work. And why is that important is it's not just important to get an answer. It's important that you have the tools and resources of be able to address it because it's almost unethical to say, I'm gonna get all this information and hear about all of these problems that are impacting, right? And for example, let's say a child with asthma gets hospitalized three times. Um, one of the things that I ask our trainees is, okay, so you talked about medications and this child is still getting hospitalized. Did you ask how they were getting the medications? Mm. Did you ask? If they ever had a, they had a car, if they ran out, how they were getting refills, because it's not just enough to educate. Mm. Um, and so I think I'm grateful for the ancillary support teams, the social workers, the case managers, the mental health therapists, because really there isn't number one time is limited and addressing some of the medical issues can do that, but really these are experts in their field and they can really address. So I think screening is important, but having those tools and resources and knowing when to use them to get that type of help is also very important. Um, yeah, that's great. And the second point I think that's even more important is really teaching the families about the impact these issues have. So whether it's a child facing behavioral issues, that may not be due to a medical developmental reason, but it's because of the environment or really sitting the parent down and going, this helps me understand where you're coming from and some of the things you're experiencing as an adult that's gonna impact how you provide care to your child is this, so we really need to get you some help. And I think empowering the family to become more, um, more advocate for themselves and really helping them understand how these things relate and impact how they're raising their kids and how their family moves forward is, is just as important. So tell me, how do you have, is it like a, a, a multi, cross-functional model that you work with in order to provide or ask, even ask those questions? Um, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think this is something that, especially in primary care, because of just the lit list of things that we are expected to take care of in one, you know, 10, 20 minute visit. Um, so I think one model is definitely multidisciplinary. I think one model of the primary care, and it might be a word that um, some of, the panelists and, and um, folks listening have heard is primary care medical home model, where it really is a medical home in the sense of you bring in a social worker, you bring in a psychologist, you bring in people who have the experience to be able to target that. And really the next step is you do it in the same visit if you can, when you yeah. have a patient right there in front of you, as opposed to trying to navigate the phone tag or bringing them in the inconvenience of another visit. Amazing. And then I have one more question for you because you piqued my interest on this form, this intake form. Is it only at intake um, or like first visit or do you kind of reassess over time uh, yeah, if anything's changed? <laughs> fantastic question. Um, recommendations are different. There's a lot of different screeners. The most common one is something called the PEARL screener. It's actually um, 
rather long form that asks. So some of that can be cumbersome, especially if you have low literacy and you don't understand. Mm. Or some families are hesitant. They don't necessarily want to share information because of that. So you have to establish that relationship. But yes, we try to bring it in when there's time, when they're sitting, downtime, waiting for the nurse or waiting for the, um, provide, the medical provider to talk with them. And then having that information input into an automated system so that we have a score, because it's all by mm -hmm. score, but we also have the level of detail and we can just kind of glance and review and then address it. So we try to kind of work that in, into, the, um, into the workflow as best as possible. You've definitely uh, been thinking about the social determinants of health, it sounds like. This is great. <laughs> I'm glad to see you do all this work around it. Um, I appreciate that. So Anastasia, um, this next question is for you and it's around uh, specifically how the Jewish Federation helps those that may be affected by social determinants of health. So are you able to share um, how Jewish Federation works with, with um, this subject? Absolutely. So the Federation works with um, in the social service space with many partners, and it also has its um, signature program called the Ezra Network. Um, and this program has been around for about 12 years now, and it provides, it's a wraparound service that provides case management, mental health counseling, financial assistance, and legal and financial support um, to those community members that were uh, negatively affected by the social determinants of health. Wow. Um, so in this program, the Ezra Network Federation works with three partners, Jewish Family Service of Los Angeles that provides case management and counseling, Beit Sedek Legal Services that provides legal assistance, and JVS SoCal um, that provides um, career counseling plus 21 synagogues and two college campuses in the Los Angeles area. Really? How many college five, campuses did you say? Two college campuses, um, one UCLA and um, Cal State Northridge. Wonderful. And 21 synagogues. Wow. So it has a very wide reach. Yeah. Um, so the <clears> program <throat> was created specifically after the economic crisis of 2008, 2009 um, in response to a great need in our community. Uh, we had rabbis across Los Angeles that were hearing from congregants that they are experiencing food insecurity. Uh, they're losing their housing. They're losing their jobs. Um, the rabbis were doing their best to address those needs and get them connected to services, but they, the services were not coordinated amongst the partners. So the Federation stepped in to address that and created a one-stop shop for the Jewish community members to to be able to navigate the social space for support that they needed. And what that meant was that community members could meet with these service professionals, social workers, job counselors, legal counselors, um, in their local synagogue, close to their home, and receive mm -hmm. culturally sensitive services. This was very crucial. This, this has removed the barrier um, to entering um, to asking for help and entering services. Um, and this program, as I mentioned, has been around for 12 years. Um, in 2022, um, the program so served 1,500 community members. Wow. Um, and uh, provide, made sure that um, those members stayed housed. They had access to transportation. Um, they were assessed. Um, and connected to government benefits. Um, they were uh, given food and referred to food pantries. And um, we, we kept their gas, their water, their power, their internet on. Um, and the job counselors helped educate uh, these clients on job search skills and assisted them with finding employment. And legal counselor helped navigate um, clients in legal issues, such as landlord-tenant issues. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of uh, people in the last three years were um, sort of on that, um, in danger of eviction, losing their housing. Um, connection to public benefits, such as um, disability um, and, uh, and unemployment issues. Um, and we consider Ezra Network um, to be a safety net really a safety net for those community members who are negatively affected by the social determinants of health. Amazing. Anastasia, how would someone know about this or hear about it if they, 
you know, we're someone in need. The information is right there on the Jewish Federation's website um, under what we do and um, caring for Jews in need. Um, also, if they speak to their um, a rabbi, for example, at their synagogue, they would be referred to a program. Um, they could call one of the uh, partnering agencies, for example, Jewish Family Service Los Angeles, um, and get connected with the program. Uh, or just through the word of mouth, you know, yeah. uh, previous clients referring their friends, family. That sounds like a really great program. Um, and a lot of opportunities maybe for our members at Jewish Federation to volunteer. Are there opportunities to volunteer with some of these programs? Um, not with this program particularly, because this program, um, as I said, we, you know, there's, um, uh, we work with partners who employ professionals, um, and it's highly confidential. However, we have volunteer opportunities overall in Federation. We have um, six service days uh, during the year, um, and you can see it up on the screen. If you go to our website, um, and you type in volunteering opportunities, um, you will be able to access this information. And there is a phone number um, and an email address on top um, where you can acquire for opportunities. Yeah, um, I don't know if someone could type that in the chat because it's a little blurry on my screen. I don't know if everyone can see it. So that would be great if someone could just type it into the chat. Um, I've had friends and participated in these community service days and they really are just heartwarming. I mean, they're, they're really... Um, a wonderful way to give back to the community. So if anyone is ever interested and has the time, it would be a great way uh, to spend your day. Um, all right. So doctor, I wanted to ask you, uh, obviously access to healthcare is a huge part of social determinants of health. People need to be able to get healthcare. So with the advent of telehealth, um, do you think this is intended to provide more access to patients or could it make it more difficult for others? Or also you can feel free to talk about just access to healthcare in general. What are your thoughts on, on access to healthcare? Well, like most things, I think telehealth is a double-edged sword where there's some great things and some not so great things. Yeah. Uh, there, you know, especially in the in the oncology environment where so many of our patients are are, are quite profoundly weak and debilitated, mm. uh, having an offering where we can connect by phone or video, which was not possible, you know, within the you know uh, reimbursement structure of, of medicine uh, before the pandemic, all of a sudden became possible. So that was a great boon. Um, I don't think. I mean, we're obviously here connecting by video, which is yeah. <laughs> so, so that's, kind of a funny question. Which is nice. Um, I don't think the quality of the interactions are necessarily as good, but at the same time, some of the support programs and educational series that we used to offer, let's say groups of 15 or 20 at a time, now we're making it available around the country, right? So we have people logging in from Seattle and Michigan. Right place which was not feasible before so I think to some degree for some especially those that might be experiencing more isolation who might benefit from you know the the human to human experience might be losing some yeah. um, opportunity of connectivity but on the other hand there are other opportunities for connection that wouldn't have existed otherwise so yeah a know, little give and take right that's my sense yeah, yeah, yeah. A little give and take because I, I feel like with the telehealth, there's there's nothing like being in person with someone. I mean, I really agree. There's nothing like being in person. But if you can increase the breadth of reach, like you just mentioned, there are benefits. So I appreciate that perspective. Um, Anastasia, we'll go to see if you have any thoughts on telehealth in general or access to healthcare. Sure. Um, so um, for the last, um, when the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, COVID pandemic began, um, the Ezra Network services really became virtual for the safety of um, the clients and the service providers. Um, and they've been virtual for about a year. Um, and after that, we switched to a more of a hybrid model, virtual and in-person. Um, I think actually providing social service virtually um, has been beneficial. Uh, for the clients, and it was a good shift for the program. 
uh, because it allowed more flexibility uh, for clients. And for example, they didn't have to, you know, a look for transportation to be able to get to the synagogue or the office to see their social worker or their job counselor. Um, and um, I think it allowed the professionals in the program um, to take on um, little uh, caseloads that were a little larger uh, because they didn't have to spend time commuting themselves. Um, I think really for the Ezra Network, telehealth um, allowed the service professionals to provide more person-centered um, services to clients um, and allowed clients to have more time, more flexibility, and confidentiality. Thank you. That's great. And Dr. Tarani, how about you? It might be hard for a, a pediatric patient to advocate for themselves in telehealth, but tell me how that works. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. Double-edged sword, you know, as, yeah. as with anything new, and especially when we think about telehealth, this all came about in the pandemic. So if you have the option of no care versus some type of care, I think phone visits and just that connection of being able to address issues um, is immensely helpful. Um, but in the pediatric population, it doesn't tend to make a lot of sense. There's a lot of objective data we need, and there's a lot of things we need the kids in the office, like how do I measure their weight or their height or give mm -hmm. vaccines or really get that dynamic and feel for it. Um, and then of course, we, we talk about kind of access to care. And generally what that means is you're really asking someone to come into a confined space within certain office hours, a lot of places don't have the staffing and resources to offer evenings or, and so in, in the childcare population is that parent either has to drag their 18 <laughs> family members or their three kids with a stroller, or they have to take time off from school. And so I think there's a give and take in everything. I do think that there are some technological challenges, even if we've tried to initiate video visits, you have to have some level of access in terms of you have to have a computer or a phone that can take those and be right. able to use them. And so I, I do think there's a there's challenges, but at the same time, I think if there are specific protocols, types of care, types of visits that are appropriate for telehealth, and then giving that family or the parent the option, I think it's actually been very useful. And in my experience, and actually based on studies, especially in the Medi-Cal Medicaid population, there is a large preference for telemed visits because it saves so much time. Um, to answer your question, though, I always think about our teenagers. Um, there's a lot of confidentiality and there's right. a lot of issues. Um, and so providing a, a framework where the teenager, you know, after school can hop on the phone or a video or I can call their cell phone and connect with them on those confidential things or even for mental health mm -hmm. providers. I think that's been a that's been an incredible um, resource for them to be able to connect with teens and adults via video visits and build that connection, right. but also not ask them to come physically to a space at a certain time that might limit that. So again, I think as with anything, it's definitely useful if there is funding for it. I think it would be incredible to kind of develop those protocols and see um, where this can, this can go and create right. more access to care. I know that I personally love my telehealth providers. <laughs> it's been a great, for the patient perspective, it's been really wonderful for me. So I guess that's a good thing. Uh, you have all been able to give a great definition of what you think is uh, what social determinants of health are, but I think more importantly, what you are doing to kind of create a better environment for social determinants of health, uh, so, which we need to change that term, Dr. Asher, I think that's a really good point. Um, I'd like to open it for questions. Uh, in the chat, if you'd like to chat or feel free even to unmute yourself if there are any questions from the audience. Now is the time. While we're waiting for questions, um, Rebecca, I don't know, did you have any questions that you wanted to pose at this point? Yeah, I'd like to actually ask a question. Um, you know, kind of um, multi-part, a little bit of uh, for everyone. So, you know, Anastasia, you talked a lot about, you know, the different um, services that Jewish Federation provides. And, you know, what's actually kind of funny is came across a couple of patients. I, I work, um, you know, some of the work I do is with um, adult special needs patients. And so when they come in, we have to have conservatorship paperwork for them in order to provide their medical care for them. 
And sometimes with a lot of these, these families, they don't know how to access this expensive to them. They don't know that there's, um, that this covered cost for them as long as they find the right resource. And as I, you know, I review all these documents and at one point when I was reviewing and there's always a stamp of, you know, where the conservator paperwork was done. And I saw the stamp in Bethetic. And so following that, I realized, oh, this is a resource. It's not just for the Jewish community, it's for the entire community. You know, the, the population I work with is, you know, primarily the Hispanic community. And so, you know, when we had patients later and they didn't know how to get this conservatorship paperwork, I actually referred them to go to Beth Zedek. Um, so from these services that you mentioned, you know, I know a lot of them are targeted more towards our Jewish community. And we want to make sure we're taking care of our, our, our own community here. Um, but which one of those other services that you mentioned are accessible to kind of the community at large. You know, a lot of these, a lot of this population is the Hispanic population. You know, I think, you know, with Dr. Tarani and I, we both work at, at a, you know, Department of Health Services, Los Angeles County facility, and these are our patient pools. Uh, so what's available to the community at large, not just the Jewish community? Sure, so um, the ESSER network is specifically a program targeted to the Jewish community. Um, however, the three partner agencies, uh, Jewish Family Service, JVS SoCal and Beit Tzedek Legal Services, they are non-sectarian, open to the entire community. Um, they have their specializations. For example, Beit Tzedek mostly works with um, older adults, uh, low-income older adults. Um, but mostly these agencies are open to the public and the Federation does support um, some of the non-sectarian programming that, that, are, that is for the larger community um, in these agencies and in other agencies. Thank you for that. And then another question that I think could be a free for all for, you know, anyone to chime in on this one. You know, I'm, you know, I'm fortunate as well. I work in a hospital setting. And so it's everything is just a phone call or an, an electronic consult away from me. I need a social worker. I type a message or I call and everything is within my network. And it's very simple. Uh, but not all physicians or healthcare workers are working in a hospital environment. You know, Kaiser is an entity within itself, and a lot of physicians do work at Kaiser. You know, Cedars, obviously, within itself, you have access. And then, you know, being at a county hospital, we have access to all of that. You know, and then for myself as well, I'm considered a specialty provider. And so I'm not necessarily the first line to be able to determine if patients need these other elements to help um, create the access and bring them into their care and kind of figure out what else is going on. Sometimes these things do come through our appointments with them. But, you know, for, you know, physicians out there or other, you know, nurse practitioners, PAs, other, you know, pharmacists, anybody else in the community who's not in a larger healthcare system, those working in private practice, especially those who are specialists and aren't necessarily primary care, what thoughts or ideas do you guys have where we can provide some insight, you know, some of the things that, you know, Dr. Tarney, that you're doing for your patients as a primary care physician, how can other specialists or other physicians, you know, primary care, even in the community, kind of bring those elements into their world and create, get that access to those social workers and, you know, mental health providers? How do people do that outside of a, uh, outside of a system? I can try to Somehow, it's a very interesting, complex question. And, you know, I often think about if I were in a private practice setting, if I were a lone practitioner on my own, would I even have time or the resources to address these things? And the answer, depending on the payer source of insurance, is probably no. Um, but I do have to say that just from a systems base, especially in primary care, as preventative medicine has kind of taken this role, um, there are now managed care plans, so things like LA Care, HealthNet, that do actually incorporate social work and community health workers who, and case management into the primary care medical home reimbursement model. So at least that you can hopefully, if you work in that, you can apply for and, and receive these. There's also a lot of grants. Um, there, there are things that you can get creative with. So even at the hospital where I work, we don't have for the volume of need that there is, there are not enough ancillary support teams to do this kind of work. And so there have been a couple of very interesting projects. Um, one of them has been actually partnering with a financial coaching service as, as a grant funded project to actually coach families with limited resources of how to make their money work for them and how to 
get access to things like employment. And that's actually was recently published. And um, the, the main author of that study spoke on NPR, and that's actually improved visit um, and access to care and compliance with visits and vaccinations and all of that. And so those are one creative ways. I think the other way is really educating yourself as a provider about your community resources. So even if it's not in your facility or in your office, what community resources, some of which we're talking about with the Jewish Federation around you exist? Is it, you know, a place that they, patients and families can access for, for food, food banks, faith-based organizations, financial programs, legal programs? So it's, I think it's very important um, to also kind of get that depending on where you work, know your resources and what's out there. Very insightful answers. Thank you for that. I think that's very helpful. Um, question coming into the chat here. Um, so a little bit more about mental health. So since mental health dysfunction is very pervasive among um, every healthcare specialty, how can we better recognize and provide access to mental health care? Um, and I, I'll add to that another element. How can we provide also trust amongst patients that the mental that they will actually get good access to mental health care and it's actually going to work for them? Because I have found personally with some of our patients, they don't trust it's going to help them because no one has helped them before. So I think with this population, it's just a little trickier. So um, any comments about mental health and you know how can we provide better access to that for our patients? It's a hard one. I'm going to stay in my oncology lane because it's a big issue in the cancer population survivorship arena. Um, one of the things that, well, one is is forums like this where, where we're raising awareness. So there's a there's a huge educational campaign directed to the surgeons and oncologists and radiation people that we're involved with to raise the importance of mental health to go side by side with cancer care. And going back to what we discussed earlier, you know, technology is a double-edged sword, um, and I and it's not just our group, but just to illustrate what we're doing, we are trying to um, develop web-based versions of our interventions. So our cognitive rehab program, it's called Emerging from the Haze, it's being videotaped and adapted for a virtual format so that people around the country can log into their own smaller group so they could still get the group support, but still have the content delivered, the strategies on how to manage depression, anxiety, fear of recurrence, which is a common issue in the cancer arena, in their own arena, or if they don't have access to a, a small group within their environment, you know, they can, they can tap in on their own individually. So I think technology might play some role, even though I admitted earlier, I don't, I don't think in and of itself, it's going to be adequate. Thank you. No, that's um great insight into that as well. Well, Dr. This... Tirani, I think was going to oh, maybe yes. comment on that. Sorry, I, yeah. I, I did, and it actually brings me back, um, Sarika, to your question as well about you know the frequency with which you ask these questions. I think trust and relationships are very important, and so the first time I meet someone, they may not be ready to divulge their entire life story to me or fill out these forms. And so really for us, we try to do it at least mm. once a year or during a preventative health visit that's a routine. And so I think it's just giving time and space to um, for the individual to be ready and, and showing that you're willing to listen, even if you may not be able to solve the problem it goes a long way. Anastasia. Yes, I was just gonna second everything that, <laughs> that the two professionals um, spoke before me. And I think um, good assessment is, is the first step to, um, to having um, access to good mental health care. Um, and again, building their relationship. Assessing and building a relationship, once the client um, has established trust with you, they will be more open to referrals mm -hmm. or um, um, to even receiving that, that help from you. I think the component of mental health, we can probably sit here all night and, and discuss very various elements of, about it and how 
you know, different patients are involved and different healthcare practitioners can kind of come together to help all these elements. But um, with that note, I think this was a really positive note to, to end on knowing that, you know, there is access to mental health for patients and we're all working to figure out new ways to get our patients assessed and continue that assessment and create that trust with our patients and, and coworkers. So uh, with that, I want to thank everyone for being here. This was a really enlightening discussion. I think we all learned a lot tonight and um, I want to thank um, Sarika, Dr. Asher, Dr. Tarani, Anastasia. Thank you all for this wonderful conversation. I want to thank all of our attendees for taking time out of their busy schedules to join us here tonight as well. Thank you for joining us virtually tonight. Um, as I shared earlier, Federation is truly a central nervous system of Los Angeles. You know, the work is vital. Sorry, the pun. <laughs> but the work is vital and the impact really is significant. Um, so for those of those of you who currently do support, you know, we thank you for that. And for those of you who want to start supporting, you can start at any level. Everything is always wonderful. It's a great way to get started. So please contact, you can contact myself or you can contact Steven Singer at S Singer at Jewish Federation. It's in the chat. And, you know, again, we want to thank you all for being here tonight, for being engaged with us. And, you know, hopefully you all learned a little something you'll take away. And again, thank you so much to our uh, wonderful panelists for taking time out of your busy schedules and really kind of shedding light on something that is an important conversation. And I think it will start to get, you know, kind of grow more and more and, and social influence, you know, let's, let's make that <laughs> kind of the new topic <laughs> around the, you know, the, the water coolers, if you will. Uh, so again, thank you all so much and we wish you all a very good evening and hope to see you all soon in person. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.